I'm Judd Myers. I'm Scott Tipton. Welcome to Blast Off. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Blast Off podcast. I'm Judd Myers. I'm Scott Tipton. And uh, we're coming to you from Blast Off Central, our shop in North Hollywood, California. Uh, on Lancashire Boulevard. We're doing some recording here, and we wanted to introduce you to our podcast. This is one of our podcasts, our Blast Off Media podcast. The first one is our Comics 101 and Retails podcast, and this one is what we call our Conversations podcast, Conversations With. And we're really, really happy to be doing this because it kind of gives us an opportunity to uh, not just have these conversations, but to introduce you to some of the great people that we have come across in our store and some very important people and a way to welcome you into these conversations that we have on a daily basis, seven days a week in our shop. When we first started talking about what we wanted to do for this podcast, it was important to me that we kind of sums up everything that we love about the place. And a big part of what we love about the place is, you know, our love of the material, our love of comics and your experiences with our customers. But And this was one of the things that was the biggest surprise to me once I became a retailer is one of the real joys of owning a place like this is the conversations you have every day. Mm, Uh, You have with both people you know really well and just people who are going to start for the first time and bring in like new perspectives and things you never thought of and are looking for just places to go and places to read and, and something new. Yeah. And it seemed the best way to do that was to kind of dedicate our show to focus on both of those. Yeah. And also, you know, there are a lot of, you know, great comic book podcasts and a lot of interview shows. But I think really what is important is that there are interesting people that come into comic book stores in all walks of life. And some of them are normal, just average guys and gals, and some of them are geniuses. <laughs> <laughs> and, and in our situation, we're in a unique place where we don't just have comic book creators. There are plenty of those. But we also have writers, actors, directors, producers, engineers, people who build rocket ships, scientists. I mean, we're in Los Angeles, so they're kind of all around us. So the broad depth of customers in Los Angeles brings us all kinds of interesting people. While we will have extraordinary people from the comic book world, there are also people who are in the adjacent (laughs) entertainment (laughs) arena. (laughs) So I'm excited about that because there are a lot of people that we'd love to introduce you to that maybe you've never heard their perspective that have a lot of things to offer some really, really cool people and even get input from everybody out there about who they'd like to hear conversations with that we have access to. Right. And we'll be kicking it off this week with our first one with writer Cecil Castellucci. Mm-hmm. And I can't think of a better way to start this off. Absolutely. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. I hope you all enjoy this process as much as we do. It is ever unfolding and it's a really cool thing to be doing along with you. And we look forward to communicating with you about it as we go along. All right, let's get to it. Our guest today is one of America's most influential young adult novelists. Her first book, Grandma's Gloves, won the California Book Award Gold Medal. Her novel, Boy Proof, debuted in 2005 and was named one of the best books for young adults by the American Library Association. She's also in the world of comics. She won the Joe Schuster Award for her graphic novel, Plain Janes, which was published by DC Comics' Minx imprint. She was nominated for a Will Eisner Award for her book, Odd Duck, And Moving Target, her Princess Leia Star Wars novel was just published to great acclaim last year. Right now, she is working on Shade the Changing Girl, which is part of the new imprint that DC Comics is putting out, Young Animal, which is spearheaded by none other than Gerard Way. Today, our guest is Cecil Castellucci. So we're getting into full disclosure here, um, and we have to do this again because the first time that we had this conversation, it was a great conversation. Trust me, everyone. I hadn't pressed the record button. It was riveting, I want you to know, (laughs) and we're now going to try to recreate that 
amazing back and forth conversation that we had. Well, it was good. It was good catch up too. I it like was, it. <laughs> it was. So, so Cecil and I first met each other 30 years ago because we went to high school together. Yep. Jed was, um, Jed was on my, uh, my stage crew. He was a sophomore and I was a senior. He was, I was a senior stage manager. Yep, and I was very, very pleased to be around all of you. I yeah. was, I was a lot shorter. I had a lot more hair. Yeah, very floppy, floppy, floppy hair. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> were you like a little skater boy? Is that what you were? No, I, I, I mean, I feel like I, would you, I feel like you were a little bit of a skater boy, or did, or was that Dominic Nardini? That was I think Dominic. I was Dominic. Yeah, yeah right, that was I was, Dominic. I was much more of a yeah. kind of um, every now and again wearing the tie dyed jeans and the. Oh, it was a little yeah. more of that. Now it's coming back. Because the curly to me. hairs. Yeah, with yeah. The, yeah, yeah. I remember. I think it was just I had a bad influence of all of you. I think I remember you too from when, you know, when you do your essays for the audition mm -hmm. and you come into the room. And yeah. I was the girl that like had to make everybody do their essays. And I think really? I remember. Yeah. I, that, that was my job. Like my three, like from freshman year until senior year. I was always the assistant in Mr. Eskow's office who made you write your essays while you waited for the second audition. And I think I remembered you from that. Because that's how, I mean, because I barely remember any of this. I mean, I don't remember any of the sophomores. You're, you're like the only one. So memorable. <laughs> well, it's, you've had your hand in very important things in my life then, because as we discussed before, you were the reason why I discovered Susie and the Banshees. First time I ever heard them play was you were playing it in the hallway you and a bunch of the girls and maybe do you, Sydney. Do you remember who I do not remember who who was I friends with then I don't know but you were all playing, everybody you were, playing, <laughs> you were playing Christine and singing to it yeah and maybe it was me and Carla Carla who was playing puck in yes, summer night's yes, dream that's was. exactly who it was it was Carla it was Carla who I'm still very very good friends with oh that's great well you can yep. relay this information I will. I'm sure she'll be related yep. by it but I did, it, it meant something to me and I, you know, I couldn't look up on my phone who these people were. So I, you know, went over to Tower Records and I found my cassette to put into my, my orange Walkman to listen to on the bus. And I was just stunned by how wonderful it was and I had to find more and more and always intended on telling you that. I really I love loved it. it, but I didn't. I was too scared because you, you know, were all like, "Oh, they're older girls and they're beautiful, <laughs> and they all are going to be famous." And I think it's funny the way that like there are these sort of core sort of canon things that become a part of our canon, like of of the things that really make us who like who we are mm -hmm. when we're in high school, and the way that we find them is so sort of accidental and um and and interesting. Well, you've discussed this before, the idea of a tribe. Yeah. Where is your tribe? Yeah. You find your tribe and you... Yeah. And That's like the theme of everything that I write, I yeah. think, is like, how do you find your tribe? How do you find the people who are your people? You know, um, and I think that's like one of the great, like I write young adult books and I think that's the, that's one of the most interesting things about writing YA is that, you know, a teenager is a person who is having the first big feelings that they're ever having in their mm -hmm. life, first big love, first big betrayal, like the first time. So everything feels like the end of the world. But at the end of the day, you grow up and you have to figure out during that sort of tumultuous time, like what kind of a, what kind of an adult are you going to be? What kind of a human are you going to mm -hmm. be? You know, and in a way that relates to shade. Because it's like, what, you know, she's like an alien who's possessed the body of a 16 year old girl. And it's like, what kind of human is she going to be now? Right. She's it's a on blank earth. Slate. Yeah. And she's a teenager, you know? So, um, so that like really marries like a lot of ideas that I like that, that theme. After you left high school and you went to NYU, mm -hmm. did your tribe change? The type of people that you were with? No. Well, gosh, that's such a hard question because I think like everybody has like a, a, a horrible, and wonderful experience in high school, potentially more horrible. But, um, <laughs> but for me, you know, I was very, very small. And, um, and so senior year was really hard for me when you knew me. I was really depressed because all of my lady friends would, uh, they, you know, they could get into bars because the drinking mm -hmm. age was still 19, I think at the time. And so you could, they could get into bars and I couldn't because I would always get us carded because I looked like I was 12. <laughs> and um, so then 
Carla and this girl, Kaz Zugaib, who was in the dance department, they were just like, we'll give you a leather jacket and, you know, we'll go to CBGBs and go to punk rock shows. And it was like, they saved my life. Mm. I mean, they didn't save my life. Like I wasn't in danger, but like they saved sort of like that. They were my real tribe, you know, and, um, and they're still two of my very, very close friends. Like I hung out with Kaz last night and it's like when I got to college, you know, I was going to film school because the reason why I'd gone to PA was because I always thought I was going to be a filmmaker. Like I'd seen Star Wars when I was seven and I was like, I am going to become a storyteller. Hmm. Clearly that means you make Star Wars. So then I'm going to grow up and become <laughs> a film director. So I used to call NYU film. Um, like from the time I was 11 years old, I'd call them and I'd be like, okay, so when can I apply? And they'd be like, how old are you? And I'd be like, 11? And they're like, yeah, you got to go to high school. I was like, high school? That's clearly a waste of my time. I just need to be making films now. And um, and uh, so then I thought, well, in order to not waste my time, I'll go to PA, performing arts, because then I'll learn how to become an actor's director. So that was <laughs> why I went. It was like my big plan was like so that I wouldn't be wasting all this time before I got to college and became, you know, <laughs> Sidney Lumet or, you know, <laughs> um, Stanley Kubrick, that, you know, um, that I could, you know, that I could learn how to be an actor's director. But ultimately, it really was all about telling stories. That's what I was interested in. Mm -hmm. So I went to NYU Film and... And one of my, the roommate who lived across the hall, who's still one of my best friends, was in the like, ETW, Experimental Theater, and I was in the film school. But like, you know, film school, the the film school, NYU Film, they were like, we hope you become an experimental filmmaker, Cecil, because you're not, you do not conform. And like, they were very cookie cutter about the way that they were sort of making people do art. I mean, I would do things like I had a sound class and I would like, um, you know, you had to record different tracks mm -hmm. and I would like record tracks of me like weeping hysterically <laughs> over the boy that I liked, you know, and like, <laughs> you know, just like putting in like low moans. I mean, it was crazy, you know, and um, and the teacher, like what some of the teachers would be like, wow, you're just crazy and experimental and that's fine, but that doesn't really fit in with, I think, making Star Wars. Mm -hmm. Like, that's not, it's not exactly, it's, I think maybe there's a disconnect here. But I did find my tribe, like, you know, I um, hung out, like my freshman mentor was this guy named Mo Willems, who, mm -hmm. um, did you ever read Don't Let the Pigeon Drive the Bus? Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. So uh, improvisation, yeah. okay. So yeah. he was, and so he had an improv group called the sterile yak and so i joined that improv group but then it was too big so um but like that was like it was david wayne and craig yeah, Wedgen. That was a, those were a lot of yeah. people that became very yeah important yeah and so um this guy todd hollaback and i because the sterile yak was too big we went and started a new group that me and him auditioned everybody in and that group eventually became the state i dropped out hmm. of school before our first show but like that that core group they became the state. And so I don't know that I found my tribe in the sense that and then we all lived happily ever after. But I, I was I was on the road on the path to finding my true tribe, because I think that, you know, that those people, um, you know, like Craig Wedron, David Wayne, uh, Mike Showalter, like mm -hmm. they were all people that like I, I was simpatico with because they were doing something, you know, like the way that they were thinking about art and the world was something way different. Just like my best friend Andrea, who's a novelist now, but also like, you know, very known underground performance artist, mm -hmm. you know, um, was looking at the world very differently. So I think that was like definitely the beginning of me finding my tribe. Do you think that becoming a musician and getting involved with like a family, it becomes a family mm -hmm. and you're traveling and then you're in situations and it's, it's boiling, you know, together. Yeah. Yeah. But you learn more about who, your role in the tribe. I think more so with the band. So eventually I dropped out of NYU, went to Paris, studied theater for a year. Um, you know, you then, know, as you know, like you do. Yeah, like, like you, you do. do. You, know, you wake up one day and you're like, I know, I'm super broke and can't go to college. I'll go to, you know, France and become an actor and, you know, learn more acting, storytelling stuff and live on baguette and red and wine. Star Wars and French. Yeah, exactly. And I came back and I went to film school in Montreal and I joined a vegetarian co-op cafe called cafe phoenix and um there were a couple of girls there and they had some boyfriends who were in bands and they wanted to start a band but none of them wanted to sing and they were like oh cecil you're very loud <laughs> maybe you'd <laughs> like to sing and i was like sure i'll sing as long as we can write a song called ew i kissed him and uh they were like okay and so you know we 
got together and, and, you know, we had our band practice and it was like, you know, someone on a soup pot with a soup ladle and an unplugged bass and an acoustic guitar and me screaming, ew, I kissed him. And, <laughs> and our j- first jam ended when the ladle exploded, but we were hooked and we made a band and, and we did that. And I think the thing that being in a indie rock band in the early 90s taught me was that you don't necessarily have to know what you're doing in order to do art. Mm. So it makes me feel kind of fearless about trying something out. So, for example, when Minx, when Shelley Bond called me up and said, hey, you've written a YA novel. Would you be interested in writing a comic book? Mm. First of all, I already loved comics. I used to Google how to submit to Vertigo Comics, like, you know, not Google. I think it was like whatever it was then, Yahoo Search. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, What was it called? Fish something? Yeah, 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 okay, That thing back then. But like I'd already been thinking about that. And I think that like, being in a punk band made me think like, yes, of course I can do it. I don't, I don't know any more than three chords, but I can definitely write a song, you know? Or for example, like I've written a libretto now for two operas, but like when, you know, when the company in Montreal asked me if I would be interested in, um, you know, writing an opera or like doing something like put, put getting put together with a composer and maybe writing an opera, mm-hmm. I was like, of course I will. Because I figure, well, not so much how hard can it be because everything is very hard, but why not? Like, why sure, not try? Sure. You know. So, um, so I think that's what the indie band gave me more. It gave me a really great sense of um, collaboration and collaborating with people because you know you're jamming with people and you have to like mix a whole bunch of ideas. Which I often think about writing comics as like being in a band because hmm. you're sort of jamming with people, and um, and it and it taught me to sort of um, say yes to any art, even if I don't know what I'm doing, because. Because if I don't like doing it, then I never have to do it again. But also, it's like, why not just try? Talking about Plain Janes, about the the Minx book that you did, and you've discussed this before, the idea of teen activism. It seems like that's a thematic in a lot of things you do. Yeah. And sort of that time period where you're not a kid, you're not an adult, you're somewhere in between, you're a little angry about it. Yeah. And you have something to say, and you need people to listen. Um, and whether it's very grounded in reality or whether it's off on a planet somewhere right. where you're all alone, right. it's still very much the same. I find that Alfred Bester, mm-hmm. the thing that I love about Bester is certainly the two most famous right, Stars, like my Destination Stars My Destination and Demolished the, Man. Oh, I've never read Demolished Man. What? All right, you I'll must. get on it. I'll get it. just so happens are, to be on my shelf okay. at my store. <laughs> there are so many um, books to read. But it, the the idea that Yes, okay, we've developed technology. We're out in space. We're on these ships. We can teleport to all these different places. We've terraformed worlds. And yet, we're still ourselves. We still litter. Right. We throw things in the hallway right. because somebody else will clean it up. And that means that those people who are cleaning up, they, they live in a different part of the ship. Right. Because they're sort of a lower caste. Right. And then they have these feelings about being a lower caste. We are who we are. We're going to be human no matter what. We don't evolve into these beings, intellectual beings. Yeah, I mean, just look at just look at the world today. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, I mean, literally today, today. look at it. And, and, and at the same time, all of these extraordinary people are inventing these amazing yeah. things that it's now science fact, not science fiction. And what used to be speculative fiction became science fiction. Mm -hmm. Science fiction is becoming reality. That's one of the things about science fiction is that a lot of science fiction is what inspired people to become scientists to mm. make that fiction actually become something that's real. Right. So it's it's this really sort of lovely thing. And once again, why art is super important <laughs> for so many reasons, you yeah, know, yeah. even like something that you think is like not something you, anybody that's listening or you or me, mm-hmm. but like a bunch of people who are not really sort of thinking about the bigger picture about how imagination or how like something like science fiction or fantasy or comic books can actually stimulate Mm -hmm. imagination that has real world sort of ramifications. Right, right. Yeah, my daughter said something to me um, a while back because she started reading science fiction, and of course, and (laughs) she read a science fiction story. I think it was H.G. Wells. Or maybe it was Arthur Clarke. I can't remember. But in it, the discussion was these stairs 
that move by themselves oh, right. and they go up. You don't even have to walk up them. They take you up on their own, these metal stairs. <laughs> and she was like, that's an escalator. Right. And I said, yeah. She said, well, didn't he invent it then? Because he came up with the idea and he even talks about how it works. And I said, well, I guess it was a collaboration. Technically he did, but somebody else had to figure out how to yeah. make that happen. And so they, they did it together. And then she got fascinated by how many other things were created by writers yeah. before they were ever actually made. Or how many things that you can't think of as a writer because you can't even imagine the possibility of that technology, right? I mean, I was on a panel the other day and we were talking about how Philip K. Dick came up with like all these like crazy things that sort of like, you know, are like uh, predictive of the future and stuff like that, except there's like like a um, answering machine with a tape like a, a cassette tape in yeah. it. because it's like you couldn't imagine like digital voice well, yeah, you know like that? what you couldn't imagine that so or it's like you see you read a lot of like golden age science fiction and they have like these crazy advanced computer computing machines and ships and stuff like that but they have to have libraries and books because they, you know they, <laughs> they couldn't imagine a kindle you know right, or right. whatever it's like everything informs everything else like science informs fiction and fiction informs science mm. i think that's a really lovely a lovely thing and the, you know i mean i don't know we went to arts you know to art school in yeah. high school i mean yeah. so it's like i think for us it was just always like obviously arts are important right. you know to do for a lot of things i mean not everybody that went to our school went off to become jennifer aniston right, right. <laughs> who we went to school with <laughs> yeah. um but you know everybody's sort of affecting the world in you know in some way or that arts thing definitely brought something to whatever it is that they're doing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. speaking about a certain type of book. We're talking about science fiction. Okay, you're a YA novelist. You're young adult specialist. You are paving the way. Um, you're um, lobbying for the LA Times Festival of Books uh -huh. to have its own YA stage yep. when it, un unbelievable that it didn't, but yeah. um, that you made that happen. Yeah. What I want to get at here is you are a uh, Young adult author, it is a, a brand that is- It's a marketing it's a, term. It's yeah. a marketing term. But like say in my store, one of the top selling books is Every Day. Right. Which is a David, David Levitt. Levitt. Man. Yeah. And it's- and It's, it's a, amazing. It's an amazing book. Yeah. However, I mean, I have a POS system, so I can see exactly who's bought what. Right. And it's extraordinary how many- Adults mm -hmm. purchase that book yeah. and come back for the sequel yeah. or the other, the companion piece. Yeah, too. companion piece. Um, and they don't see it as a young adult book at all. I think there's been a lot of data that has come out that has said that I think over 65% of young adult books are being read by women over 35. Hmm. So it kind of makes you call into question, well, what, what does young adult mean then? You know, um, I have a lot of theories about sort of what makes a book young adult and what makes a book an adult book with a young protagonist. So like an adult book with a young protagonist, something like Life of Pi or mm -hmm. um, The Particular Sadness of Lemon Cake by Amy Bender. Mm -hmm. Those are books where there's an adult self-awareness or there's a nostalgic look back. Mm -hmm. And something like Every Day or, um, you know, or any of my books, um, the action is happening immediately to the character like it's not there's no self-awareness it's mm -hmm. like and that's why oftentimes a lot of young adult books are in the first person mm -hmm. i mean the truth is is that a book is a book is a book is a book right you yeah. can ask any adult on the planet what was the first book that they fell in love with like what was the book that made them a reader and it's always going to be a young adult book Adults, when they go through trauma or whatever, a lot of times they'll go back to like to try to explain that stuff. Or if you want to give a gift to someone who's going through something, you give them a picture book, you give mm. them Alice in Wonderland, mm. you give them these like children's books because children's books are actually all ages books in right. the true sense of the word, just like comics. You know, a lot of comics, I mean, there are some mature comics, but a lot of comics, like it's like what um, Hervé said, you know, for it's like, uh, Hergé, sorry, mm. like for Tintin, where it's like the age range for Tintin is seven to 77. Yeah. That's the age range. <laughs> and I think that's the sort of, that's the trick secret about young adult books is that they're just books, right. but they just have a lot more sort of, they're a lot, they're, they're, at, a, they're at a quicker clip they have maybe a little bit more hope in them, mm -hmm. but there's no subject, there's no topic, there's no sophistication that is not available in a young adult book. Yeah. It's just a marketing category. I think in the alternative 
comic world, it's easier to make comparisons. Like Craig Thompson, Blankets is an easy way to say, well, actually, many, many, many adults read this. Right. But it's daunting for a young adult to pick it up and read it. But the thematic is more, it's, it's more suitable for the young adult. But that book came out when there wasn't really a young adult category. That's right. right? And it was also... It was also named one of the top 100 books of the year right. for time, from Time Magazine. Yeah. Not graphic novels, right. but books, right. which I thought was just yeah. shocking. Yeah. I had you know these 70-year-old these women coming in with a list in their hand. I'm looking for something called Blankets. <laughs> and I would, I would give it to them, and they'd like, what is this? And I'd go, it's, it's okay. It's just got pictures in it. I, you know, <laughs> it's funny. It's interesting because I feel like, you know, I came into writing Young Adult in 2005, and that was sort of just the beginning of the golden age of young adult fiction. Before mm. that, like, there were sort of young adult books, but, um, you know, there were young adult books, but it wasn't the sort of juggernaut category that it is now. You know, there was middle grade, and then there was sort of like, there were some young adult books, but, you know, but it wasn't like as big of, of, a, of a marketing category. And then this golden age sort of came in you know, like books like Speak by Laurie Hall mm-hmm. Sanderson came out and um and and this sort of ushered in, you know, like a um like a like a new sort of golden age of young adult fiction. And then I feel like it's the same thing like with um with graphic novels for young people. Like I you know, it was the same thing. Like Minx came out, that was ten years ago, and you know, and it was, you know, it was a little bit before its time. Mm. And um and now there's a golden age of young adult, you know, graphic novels and yeah. there's sort of a, a, a section for it like when I, when the plain janes came out barnes and noble and borders that was still there at the time and a lot of indie bookstores like they didn't they they refused to to shelve it in the ya section now they shelve it in the ya section when you know uh, like in 2000 you know in in the early 2000s it, like they didn't there was like maybe one little shelf of ya now mm-hmm. it's an entire sec it's an entire section of yeah, like yeah. barnes and noble you yeah. know so it's a whole different whole different thing so it's really interesting to have started my career like to 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 sort of been in the sort of the beginnings of both golden ages of mm. these two very very different things but they both deal with young adult like young people's literature but young adult has changed the young adult here in the world has changed considerably. So do you feel like, how do you think? Like, what do you think? Do you feel like you've changed your, your style of writing? Because I mean, right now, like you look at 10 star. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is one of her books. It's one of my books. (laughs) It's good. It's Um, about a human girl who's abandoned on an alien space space station at the brink of a galactic war. She's a young adult. mm -hmm. She's like 14 when she gets abandoned. She's 16 for most of the story. And yet, if you take that book mm-hmm. and you take it back to 1990, mm-hmm. would people know what to do? Would librarians know what to do with that book? No, would, I think Tin Star in 1990, I think would have been an adult science fiction book. Right. Yeah. That, I guess that's what I mean. Yeah. And now our youth culture is so so much more advanced in the information that is put into their brains. And unfortunately, to some extent, let the innocence is lost. Um, but at the same time, youth, and I know this from my own daughter, um, they have the capacity now to take all of this information, the information age that's shoved at them every day, and process it and still retain a youthfulness, but just be more intelligent, question more things, and, and understand more things. But it's sort of like a chicken and the egg thing, right? Because it's like, does young adult exist now? And is it as sophisticated it is, as it is now because there's a market for it and mm. because there's a um, because there's a, a, a marketing category for it where there wasn't, right? Like, so when we were growing up, there was juvenile fiction mm-hmm. and then there was adult fiction, right? And so a lot of us, our young adult fiction was mm. genre. So you'd go from reading, you know, uh, Trumpet of the Swan or, you know, what like Cricket in Times Square to reading uh, romances, mm-hmm. fantasy, mm-hmm. science fiction, mysteries, horror. Yep. You go straight to genre. And then that was your that was your high school reading. Right. And then then you get to Kafka, you know. <laughs> so there was no sort of category. There was no there was no place for it. So it's like, you know, when we were 
when when there was no marketing section for YA mm -hmm. and we all went to genre, we were reading sophisticated stuff. I yeah. mean, you know, it's like Stephen King is sophisticated. Dune, Frank Herbert, that's sophisticated. Right. Isaac Asimov, you know, like uh, uh, Kurt Vonnegut, like that's all, you know, sophisticated. So it's not, I don't think it's that like kids got more sophisticated or that, you know, I think it's just that, that, that it's like we made more steps for people to sort of go to where they're, they naturally want to go, mm -hmm. you know? So, um, you know, the, the thing about reading genre when there was no sort of YA section, mm -hmm. like, is that um, no, none of those authors had to consider or think about their audience. They didn't have to say, oh, well, is this appropriate or inappropriate mm. for a young person? So the thing with young adult, having like a, a section for young adult is that you know, everybody has an idea about what's appropriate or inappropriate for people under 18, mm -hmm. which is why children's books and young adult novels are the most banned books. Like if you look at the top 10 <laughs> right. books that are banned every year, it's all young adult. And that's that's a very, very interesting thing. So what do you do as an adult who's writing a book? Like I don't actually sit down and say, I'm writing a young adult novel. I mean, it's just, I'm writing a book and mm. they just happen to always come out as young adult novels. Like I, you know, it's like, you know, but it's not like a young adult novel can't have sex in it or, right. you know, violence or, you know, any of those things. It's just, you know, like, because there's all different kinds of kids too, right? There's sophisticated 12 year olds and unsophisticated 12 year olds. Right. I, I remember, because I, I think when we were young, it was a fact finding mission. We sort of were on our own. Now it is very much, you right. can get online and go, yeah. here's the top 100 books you should right. read. Or you go into a store and it's all, you know, segregated for you. Mm -hmm. But I remember I was a big Bradbury fan and I, I would always look for Ray Bradbury wherever I went and yeah. I was in the strand and I was looking for any Ray Bradbury I hadn't read and I couldn't find any, right. but I like, I, I sort of knocked something over and a book fell and hit me in the head and it was Fade by Robert Cormier. Oh yeah. And I had no idea what it was, but it seemed like a really weird idea and, um, and I bought it and I was beat up copy and I read it and it, it just, it absolutely shocked me. Um, be, and I carry it in the store now too, because it's a, it's a great story with a little controversy in it. Um, but it's written, it's, it's not written down to, to youth. He wrote that just as here's a story. It just so happens yeah. that the protagonist is a young kid who finds out that his whole family has a gene that can turn them invisible yeah. when they hit puberty. Yeah. Like, Oh my God, what kid is not going to think about that? Yeah. And then the idea of, well, what would you do? Now there's a morality tale in yeah. there. The good, the bad. You can very easily make the wrong choice yeah. with this power and become something that you didn't want to be. Yeah. Um, the, just the, the idea of that was fascinating. But I had to find that myself or it had to find me. Well, but that's the great thing about books, right? That's the great thing about music. That's the great thing about art, paintings, movies, is that like, you know, hopefully they're they're always there so that you can stumble upon them and stumble upon the right thing for you. Just kind of like the way you stumbled upon Susie and the Banshees <laughs> when I was like sitting there in the hallway with Carla Ray, you know, is that it's like you never know where you never know what the math is that's going to bring you right. to the moment where you're going to find your new favorite thing, you know, and, and sure, I'm, look, I'm, a, I'm a cult author. I'm, I, you know, I'm on the obscure, I, I'm, I'm on the out, you know, even though I've had like some nice successes, I'm not the hunger games, you mm. know, it's like, so I'm not like getting like millions of marketing dollars from, you know, from, you know, my publishing companies mm -hmm. or stuff like that. So it's like when I go in and do a school visit, you know, most of the kids like- Although producers out there, Tin Star would make one hell of a movie. Just yeah, saying. I think so too, <laughs> sorry, sorry, it would. But, um, but like, you know, it's like I go into a school and I think it's hard for kids to um, sort of navigate through 
all this stuff that's coming at them, right? They're being marketed at in every single possible way. So Mm -hmm. how do you find that sort of accidental gem that's going to change your life? You know, like fade. Mm -hmm. Like for me, it was um, Mockingbird by Walter Tevis, Mm -hmm. you know, that, um, that, Dominic Nardini, you know, um, gave me one day. He was like, here, I think you'd like this book. And I was like, what? And then it's like, I was like, oh my God, this book is amazing, you know? And and he gave it to me because he knew that I liked The Man Who Fell to Earth. Mm. And I hadn't, you know, I hadn't like looked at what what else this guy had done. And then it's like, oh, about a robot who wants to commit suicide? What? Like, what is happening, you know? Um, so it's like, I think that, I think every opportunity that you can so when I go and do a school visit right there's one kid usually in the back who's got like too many braces <laughs> and too many rubber bands in their you know in their face and like you know everybody else might be wearing a Doctor Who shirt but they're like wearing like like a more obscure you know yeah, like shirt yeah. and like you know and then they hear me speak and they're like oh my oh my gosh I ne-, like that that you know and yeah. it's like and I think I think I think like one of the great things about browsing is not like it's not browsing like on the internet or having something sort of show up on your phone, but like actually going in and flipping through records or flipping through comic books or like Mm. pawing, pawing the stuff and sort of seeing things that you never would have seen before. I mean, there's something that's really beautiful about that. About the hunt. Yeah, the hunt. I was, you know, thinking about this idea of labels and branding i mean you have if you have a publisher an agent a manager who's saying to you when's your next Mm -hmm. book coming out they're thinking all about the ya market i mean because that's what you know that's where they can place you and do all kinds of you go on the the tours that you go on and you have a a sort of it's there's a way about it and it's the thing that makes you a living and is what you're comfortable with um, I, but see, it's but, so funny because I don't think about it like that. I just think I just write and then they just kind of, oh, okay, it's this. Okay. <laughs> but maybe that's my delusion. Maybe that's like my safe bubble. You know, but have you, like, I mean, have you written anything yet where it's sort of not outside your comfort zone because you only write what's comfortable for you, but, um, d- but it, the, where it's, well, actually this doesn't fit into the YA market. Well, yeah, do you have a desire I mean, for that? I do. Yeah. I mean, I absolutely do. I mean, I, um, you know, I, I, I once made a feature film, a little indie feature film and, um, you know, and that was about my adult concerns as a, as a lady, you know, and, uh, I've, uh, I've, uh, I've written a bunch of science fiction stories mm-hmm. that, you know, have been on like tour.com or, um, strange horizons yeah. or apex magazine. And those are all adult science fiction short stories not ya at all yeah and um i wrote you know i, I wrote libretto for opera those mm-hmm. are you know it's like yeah so it's like i i just kind of i try to challenge myself each time i mean i would say doing an ongoing like shade that's out of my comfort zone because mm. it's a very interesting thing right i've got a 16 year old character but the alien is like 22 23 so she's not a teenager and right. also it's like i'm on a mature imprint so i can actually you can do, do whatever, you want. whatever i want and it's kind of like oh <laughs> oh my goodness okay yes you know i mean like i had my editor was like you can use the f word because i put i'd put like f like a little squiggles <laughs> and he was like he was like jamie was like no you can just use the f word i was like oh dear lord you know like that's not true i wasn't really like that but but um but you know that's like and that's incredibly freeing because it goes back to what we were talking about with like Frank Herbert or, you know, Ray Bradbury, they, you know, their books appeal to young people, Mm -hmm. right? When there was no YA section, but they didn't have to worry about like, is this appropriate or is this not appropriate? Is this going to get me, is this going to not get me into a library at a school or not? You know, they didn't have to think about that. And so having that mature imprint is very freeing for me because Mm -hmm. I can write about all the things that I like about writing young characters, but I don't have to worry about it being categorized as young adult right and do you have a story arc that's you i mean is it is this a 12 issue run is this an on just a sort of open-ended run do you have a i mean i I don't know (laughs) (laughs) i mean it's i mean i think it's ongoing until they you know they stop it but um i think i think um I mean, I'm I'm still going. <laughs> I just handed in issue six, and I'm thinking about issue seven. So, so is that how you do it? Do you I'm think still of, going. You, do you think? I mean, how far ahead are you thinking? Are I you- I already know what I would want to do up until 
issue 12 for sure. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm seeding, I've already started seeding things in that I think like, you know, okay, I guess this could pay off like in year two or mm-hmm. whatever. I mean, I, I'm, and that's very new for me to have to think in that um, sort of very long-term way. But I mean, who knows? I mean, it could all get, you know, it could all get canceled, but, um, but that's, it's very, it's but it's to. very exciting. It's going to be very successful. I'm excited about it. And I just, you know, um, I don't know. I'm super nervous. <laughs> like, it, it You're super nervous super about super how nervous it's going to be received? It. Yeah. I'm just super nervous. Well, I've read you know? a preview copy of number one and I can tell you it's damn But what good. about number two, Judd? <laughs> what about number two? <laughs> hey, listen, I'm going an issue at a time. All right. 22 pages. That's, that's sort of how we do it in retail. Yeah, it's yeah. like, look, but you know, this it's month, like, but you know, it's like, you just never know, right? I mean, I'm damn proud of issue one and I'm damn proud of issue two. And mm. I'm damn proud of what, you know, what we're doing. I mean, Marley's art is amazing. Yes, it is. Um, Shade is like a super, super interesting character. I think I've got, I think I'm, I think I'm writing a pretty good story. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but, um, you know, uh, but um, yeah, I mean, so, so that's like the new, t- what I like as an artist is to, um, to try to challenge myself, you mm. know? So like, for example, when someone said, um, Oh, do you do you want to write an opera? I was like, yes, I do. Even though I don't know how to do that, <laughs> or like when I wanted to make a film, you know, and then my friend was like, okay, my friend will give us ten thousand dollars, and I was like, great. And then I just like made a film, and I asked some actors that I knew, and I was like, okay, here are two questions, and I'm going to write a script based on your answers. And then that's what I did. I asked them two questions. I wrote the script. I workshopped it with them, and then I just shot it. And it's. I mean, it holds up Mm. like it's I did it 11 years ago and I had like a 10th anniversary screening and I was like, this is like a nice little French film. (laughs) It's like a little Eric Romare film. So you've said that perfection can stop art. Mm -hmm. You've talked about how if you if you're if that's what you're going to do, it's going to you'll take forever to do something or you won't do it or you won't do it. Um, And best that you push forward. I think um, Bradbury said similar things in that everybody would go to Bradbury and say, I want to be a writer. You're inspiring me. I want to be a writer. And you know, what should I do? Do you have advice? And he'd say, did you write anything today? Yeah. And if they said, yeah, you're a writer. Yep. It's, they didn't say, how can I be the most successful writer in the world? How can I, the question was, how can I be yeah. a writer? Right. Yeah. And, um, see what happens. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I I call it like what you were talking about before is like, I hear a lot of people say, well, I can't do this because I don't have this, that, or the other thing or whatever. And I call that the like, why are you worrying about what you, so you're not going to do that thing because you don't have a dress to the Oscars. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it's like you stop yourself. Like, well, I don't have a dress to the Oscars. So I clearly can't write (laughs) it a script or a story that might be turned into a film, you know, or anything like that, because I don't, I don't have anything to wear to the Oscars. And it's like, really? Like, you know, how about you just write something and then worry about the dress, you know? (laughs) Um, when I first decided that I was going to write for kids, I actually had written a letter to Madeline Langell because um, I was really, one day I was like 25 and I was like, you know, I love children's books and I had this Alice in Wonderland collection and um, and I was like, and I love Madeline Langell because A Wrinkle in Time, you know, it was a mousy brown haired girl with glasses and she was the daughter of scientists and had a brilliant younger brother and that was my reality. Mm. Both my parents are scientists, you know, but Meg Murray saves the world, right? She saves the universe. And so I wrote Madeline Lingle a letter and I was just like, hey, thanks for writing that book. Like it really meant a lot to me because I'm the daughter of scientists and whatever. And and then I admitted to her and it was the first time that I'd confessed that I had this idea that maybe one day I'd like to write for young people. And I was like, I think maybe one day I'd like to write for young people. And she wrote me back Mm. and she was like, dear Cecil, if you want to write for young people, why don't you sit down and write for young people? And I was like, oh, Oh my God, you're right. I could just Crazy. totally do that. And that's when I pretty much started writing my first unsold, horrible <laughs> novel. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, <laughs> it was a start. Do, have you have you ever received any letters or any has any young kids ever reached out to you or at, a, at one of your events? Has, has anybody come up to you and given you that sort of... Yeah, I would say with the Plain Janes. The Plain Janes, um, I get the most sort of heartwarming emails after the fact. Like people who write me and say, 
I stole this book from the library and never <laughs> returned it <laughs> in high school, but now I'm at the School of Visual Arts because, you know, or, um, uh, you know, I became an artist because of this book or, you know, like this was the book that made me think that I could go do things or, you know, I, I, like that book really just, I think was like a, an art Bible for a lot of, a lot of kids who, mm. you know, um, sort of were, you know, we're outsiders. I mean, the Plain Jane's about this all-girl guerrilla art group and they do street art and um, the main character survived a terrorist attack. And so um, her parents have moved her to the suburbs. So she starts this this guerrilla art group because she wants an attack to be something beautiful rather than something ugly. Mm. And um, and I think that that, that that idea that art saves just really sort of resonated with a lot of a lot of people. So for that one, I get a lot. But then I've gotten like an, I got an email once from a girl and she said, um, she said that, you know, her, her mom had bought her the book Boy Proof and that her mom and her had never, ever gotten along and that her mom had always and consistently had bought her the wrong things. Hmm. But she bought her Boy Proof and her mom had read Boy Proof and she said it was the first time I sat down with my mom and had a conversation at breakfast. And I was just wow. like, oh, I could retire, <laughs> you know, like, I don't, I could just stop, you know, like, um, and Boy Proof, you know, was one of the first books that made the nerds front and center and not the sidekicks. You mm. know, they're all obsessed with comic books and science fiction mm. and they're the main characters. They're not like the kooky best friend. Which is also ahead of its time. Yeah. Because now it's it's a, a de rigueur yeah. yeah you go to yeah. you go to the the middle school and you see you know bad wolf written on lockers oh yeah <laughs> no <laughs> i know I, well, I volunteer at an elementary school i've been volunteering at this um elementary school doing read aloud and literacy for um 15 years now and uh and the kids now they're like well i'm a nerd miss cecil i'm a nerd <laughs> i'm like really really you're a first grader yeah <laughs> like you're i'm a nerd <laughs> but i mean but it's wonderful i mean it's a nerd's paradise out there right now but also there's you know you're on a million panels you're on all these different you go through these tours it's here's five f women nerds here are the geek girls mm -hmm. here's the nerd yeah. girl panel here's you know nerd girls in comics nerd go yeah over and over and over again do you ever fear that there's that being put into this Again, a category mm -hmm. of look these girls who are in. And, well, that's like a whole other thing. And I'm you like get so five tired. women yeah, like who so, all write yeah. in all these different formats. Yeah, but here they are up on a panel, to, you know, because oh, they like Star Trek or Star Wars or. You know, it's interesting because I just did a panel at Salt Lake City and it was, um, it was, you know, because I wrote a Princess Leia novel. Yeah, <laughs> we there's were talking that. about that. Yeah, we I wrote a Princess talk about yeah, that. I wrote a Princess Leia novel um, called Moving Target. And um, so I was in Salt Lake City and, um, and there were three, you know, it was a Star Wars literature panel mm -hmm. and it happened to be uh, uh christy golden um this girl ek i'm blanking on her last name but she wrote the the ahsoka book that's coming out and me who did princess leia right mm -hmm. and so it's three women authors of star wars no star wars novels three um writing about three different women characters in star wars mm -hmm. and the moderator who's a great guy but like you know he was like so is it hard for women and like all three of us were like we're done yeah. no no more of that question and i think that's what it's like i mean i hate being on like women in comics panel because then it's just the same like things that you've been talking about for 10 years who cares yeah, yeah. obviously people let's just you know it's like let's just talk about the process and right. not about our gender, you right. know? Um, so that's super annoying. I mean, it's more interesting or annoying or whatever. The idea that like, I've spent my entire life being an outsider, right? I've, I've spent my entire life being like a girl nerd, you know, when there were no girl nerds, you know, mm. when being nerdy was something that like nobody wanted to admit to, you know? I mean, I started going to comic book conventions, to creation conventions, mm. you know, in New York, like in 1981, you know? <laughs> um, so, and then, you know, also, you know, liking punk rock and indie rock, which mm -hmm. was, you know, I mean... I, when I got my tiny little nose ring in like 1987, I mean, I, you know, it was just like the world ended. It was like, <laughs> oh my God, you're never going to be able to get a job. This is the, <laughs> you're the most, this is crazy radical. It's like now it's like, it's not even anything, right? Like everybody, everybody's got tattoos. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. so 
the, I think the thing that's really interesting is if you're an outsider and mm. you've been an outsider, you've been fighting for this world where it's a nerd punk world. It's like, wow, where does that put you? How do you, you know, it's like now you're the mainstream, right? Mm -hmm. So who are the new nerds? Who are the new outsiders? And I, I'm interested in, I don't know. I mean, I'm interested in like all the stuff that I'm interested in, but I'm also interested in not being the same, not being the same as everything else. Right. Yeah. I'm a big fan of Octavia Butler, who I think is um, a, really a, overlooked in so oh many my ways. Oh, She's so amazing. And uh, again, books that I carry in my store mm -hmm. all the time. But um, recently at the Huntington Library, they had all of her notebooks. Mm -hmm. They released all of the interiors of her notebooks. And it was fascinating to, to see these notes written in the margins. And during a time where she was making no money, mm -hmm. she was, you know, t like cleaning someone's house, I think. And, and just, you know, a day after day, just relentless about this is what I am. Not this is what I'm going to be, but this is what I am. And one of the lines written in the margins, the sentence that it was a series of sentences, but it was all in the margins. And it, it said something like, I am not a, black female science fiction writer. I am not a female science fiction writer. I am not a science fiction writer. I am a writer. Oh my God, I just got goosebumps. <laughs> <laughs> I think I might cry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and It's the same thing, right? It's like, it's like even with YA, like a lot of people like, you know, they're like, when are you going to write a real book? <laughs> and it's like, I've written 17 real books. You can go read them. <laughs> you can get them at real. your library. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, um, it's it's hard. But I mean, you know, I think everybody has their own sort of like struggles and insecurities and, you know, like, I don't know, you know, yesterday I, I, I was having a conversation with my friend, a wonderful writer named Cherie L. Smith. And I, you know, I was like, having like a crisis i was like oh, maybe i just i'm not a writer and i don't know what i'm doing she's like what <laughs> she was like hey, you need like you need to like go get a cookie or something and eat <laughs> it because i think you're having like a sugar situation <laughs> but you know but i think i think it's i think i think like octavia maybe writing those things in the it's because it's so hard being an artist and it's you're just you're just throwing it you're just throwing your stuff out there into mm. the, you know, and, and, you know, it's funny because it's like, you're saying like, oh, you know, and you're successful and you've gotten all these awards and you go on these tours. I'm like, I'm, uh, nobody knows who I am. <laughs> I know, nobody's reading me. All I want is for one person to read me, you know? And it's so, I think it's like, you just never, you just never know how you're being, you know, perceived. Like mm. I always think like, well, you know, no one's reading me. And then I'll get an email like, Hey, I went to, you know, I went to art school because The Plain Janes was one of my most fa favorite books in the world. And, mm. you know, and I just wanted to make all art all the time, like you say in every interview, like whatever. And it's like, oh, right. That's why you do it. Because one person did actually read it, mm -hmm. you know. And very often it's very difficult. You hear of a new author that you haven't read before. You There's 17 books to choose from. <laughs> you know, some of them are, are more difficult to get than others. <laughs> yep. Like First Day on Earth. Yeah, First Day on Earth. I just, I need that to Ow, be in print Me too. immediately. That one breaks my heart. That's Because you know. it's a great book and I would make a lot of money off of it. <laughs> That's the one book that like, like, it's not technically out of print, it's out of stock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, uh, but you can still listen to the audio book and read it yes. on a Kindle or go to and your library. Yeah, yeah, the library has but, it. Um, but that's like copies. the one book where, you know, it's like, I wouldn't want any of my babies to like, you know, be put out of print, like, you know, whatever. But that one, it's like, but I could surely, another one could go out for that one to stay in. Yeah, I love that book. For someone who, is, it's hard to commit to mm -hmm. something. That's what short stories are, are so good for. Mm -hmm. I mean, Bradbury was great for me when I was young because I could take them in yeah. eight-page bites mm -hmm. and it didn't feel overwhelming to me. But there's a couple online at Tor.com. Oh, yeah, there are. We Have Always Lived on Mars is one of them. And I very much suggest you all go out and, and just type it into your – it's easy. Open up your computer and look because you can get it right there and you can just read it. And it's, it's absolutely wonderful. It actually reminds me a hell of a lot of Bradbury. Yeah, um, I've been told that. A lot of really people does. have said that, yeah. And there's a piece of art by, I don't remember who it is. Oh, yeah, it's gorgeous. It's an evocative yeah. piece of art. Um, and then there's another one called Brother Prince Snake, mm -hmm. which is a sort of uh, 
I won't say an adaptation of a Prince Lindworm story, but it's a, a reinterpretation. Reinterpretation. Yeah. yeah. And it is stellar. Like to thank me, you. it's got this Le Guin kind of oh, vibe to it. And I, I again, if you love if you love fantasy, if you love fairy tale, um, if you comic fans out there love fables, go and read it. It's very very good. And then share it with everyone you know it's such an easy thing to do i would like to ask please to sh just for you to write more short stories <laughs> perhaps well, a collection of short stories that's my dream it's on my you know i have like a literary bucket list mm. and one of my literary bucket lists is to um have a collection of all my speculative um short science fiction and fantasy stories Ooh. it's a dream Wow. So We're, any small presses out there who want me to, you know, I've got tons and, on, just, and comics as well. Wait, I don't understand. Yeah. You just said, just do it. Just let's make it happen. Yeah, let's, I just got to, yeah, I got to. Come on, yeah. let's do this. I always, well, I know, I even though I said before, like, you know, don't be afraid, just do things, do, do, do. Sometimes it's like you feel like, oh, I, there, a, a, a few certain things need to be sort of, like I need to be at a certain level before mm. I could do sort of like something like that. I mean, I could just like, put something out like what that? level is that i don't know one level fancier <laughs> that's okay i'm i'm calling bullshit here no. I, I'm, I'm sorry i've got to i've got to you we've just spent like 50 minutes and you you being the consummate like fearless punk rock artist <laughs> you can't do that <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're allowed to, as an artist who is punk rock and fearless, you're allowed to have small pockets of fear <laughs> and, and, and shyness. You're okay, allowed. <laughs> all right. Um, well, I'm totally not going to, we're going to, after this is all over, I'm going to continue with this. You're going to get emails from me. You're going to get phone calls. But you have that short story collection yet? I think I'm getting close though. I think I am getting close to being ready, but it's like one more level of fancy. <laughs> Come what on, does that shade. Look like? What does that <laughs> I don't know. Look like? But you know, I don't know. But there are certain things where it's just like you know when you're ready. Okay. And it's like you just you just know. And yeah. it's like it's like I've always kind of felt like that. That like like there are things that I want to do, and then I kind of like I'm like okay, now I'm ready to do it. It's mm. like it's not a particular thing. It's just. I mean, it's like you're a bird that's molting or like a, you know, or like a, like, a, you know, it's like you have to like sort of, you know, like a snake shedding your skin to mm -hmm. the next level. It's like, it's like a growth thing, you know, it's like, and so I think that for me, I'm not known for like my adult literary fiction. Mm -hmm. So I think writing or having a collection of speculative adult short stories mm -hmm. of fantasy and science fiction is it's not quite the right time for me to do that. Not, hmm. but it's something I'm definitely going to do, but it's just, you know, it's just, that's, it's just, it's like, it's like this. I mean, I'm doing, you know, it's like, it's yeah. like, you just have to, you know, it's just the shift isn't there yet. Well, feedback from a retailer is, um, yeah, I, I, I could sell it. <laughs> just <laughs> thank you, Jen. Just saying, <laughs> just saying, um, this has been a great interview. I'd like to talk forever. Um, but, um, I, I want to try to keep within a certain time mm -hmm. constraint. But I do have a few questions mm -hmm. that I want to ask you. Okay. Because this is going to be something I think I'm going to start doing regularly. Okay. I'm ready. They're just quick and fire I'll be questions. Short. Okay. They're quick fire questions. Okay. What is the first comic that you ever remember reading? Oh, I would definitely say that that was probably Tintin, um, uh, 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 the um, Red Rackham's Treasure, and you know all all the Tintin books. You know, because I'm French. Yeah. So, did you, you read know. them in French? Or yeah, read them in French. And where'd you get them from? Uh, my mom um, got them for me. But then I think I'm going to change my answer and say that I think it might be Batman because mm. um, because when you know when I was four, I was in love with Adam West. <laughs> And so my mom um, and dad bought me uh, these like uh, these like omnibuses of like uh, 1950s, 1940s and 50s Batman and Superman comics. Mm. So I just would like read all, you know, those. In English. In English. Yeah. <laughs> in English. Yeah. First novel you remember reading and, and it affecting you. Oh God, this, these are really hard questions, mm -hmm. Jed. These are super hard Same questions. Idea. The first novel that I remember reading and really affecting me, I'm going to go with, I'm sure there's a different answer that I will come up with tomorrow, <laughs> but I'm going to go with The Tripod Trilogy by John Christopher. Ooh, okay. That's interesting. Yeah. Do you know it? Yes, I do. Yeah, it's good. That's 
Wow. I should have expected there to be some like left field answer from you. Okay. The most influential song in your life. A song? Does it have to be song or can it just be a piece of music? It can be a piece of music. Uh, or okay, well actually maybe it's a song. It's uh I don't know what the title of it is, but it's the um the song about uh from um that Violetta sings in um La Traviata, mm. you know, where she's just like, Who needs love? I'm just gonna drink <laughs> champagne. Who needs love? That one. And uh so that's the song. Also appropriate. Okay. Most influential movie. Well, I have to say Star Wars because okay. it was um when I saw at the end of Star Wars when uh, Darth Vader went spinning off mm -hmm. after the Death Star blew up, spoiler, uh, <laughs> I, um, I, it was the first time that I understood that stories could continue and it was someone's job to write that story. Mm -hmm. And that was the moment, that was my origin story of when I knew I was going to become a, a storyteller. It was like, that was the moment. So even though there were probably other Movies like, you know, Robin Hood with the foxes, <laughs> like that were very influential. I think Star Wars, because it's the origin story of why I decided to dedicate myself to becoming a storyteller, has to be, by default, the movie of my life. I got to stop there. I, I had a couple more, but I don't want to even ask them. <laughs> They're not even important anymore. <laughs> Cecil, thank you so much thank for doing you, this Jed. with me this has today. It's been super fun. It's really cool that after all of this time, that all these years, I know, to cross <laughs> it's over. It's still yeah. there, still happening. Yeah. I am very, very happy to still be in your sphere of influence. Yay, me too. Thanks for joining us. If you'd like to know more about Cecil Castellucci, you can visit her website, castellucci.wordpress.com, or you can come to blastoffcomics.com and see more about her work and see some photos that go along with the podcast. Her short stories are online. I suggest you go look Strange Horizons, Tor.com, Apex Magazine, Black Clock, The Rattling Wall, Yarn. All of these places have her work, and some of them are free. You can just call them up and have a look. There's so many online that you can look up. You can also find her work in our retail store in the Arts District in North Hollywood, California. We have a display of her work, and you can come and talk to us about what you think. It's 5118 Lancashire Boulevard in North Hollywood. We look forward to seeing you. The Blast Off Podcast is produced by The Colonel, Jeff Fox, Scott Tipton, and me. Original music is composed and performed by Derek Anthony Gray. You can find more of his musical compositions on his website, DerekAnthonyGray.com. For more information about anything you've heard us talk about today, check us out online at BlastOffComics.com. We have an active Facebook presence, so check us out over there on Facebook. And you can reach us on Twitter, at BlastOffComics, or on Instagram. Or you can come by our retail location in North Hollywood in the heart of the Arts District, 5118. Lancashire Boulevard in North Hollywood, just two blocks south of Magnolia. See you soon.